Okay. Thank you, Chris. Is this thing on? Apparently so. Okay, so I'm going to talk about open source. Before I do, um, a lot of this talk is based from my experience and a bit of research I've done as well. And because my background is in Objective C and PHP and some JavaScript, that's where my sort of examples are going to come from. Um, and well, open source pretty much exists in everything. So if you're doing something else, then keep using it. Um, and lots of people think open source is a cult or incredibly religious, which to some people it sort of is, but that's not really what this talk is about. Okay, so. <sighs> Anvil, okay. So this was written on NS Hipster by Matt Thompson, and that's not a spelling error in case you're wondering. His name is actually spelt like that. Um, so Objective-C's fourth act takes us to the present day with an influx of new iOS developers from Ruby, Python, and JavaScript communities sparking a revolution in open source participation. For the first time, Objective-C is being directly shaped and guided by the contributions of individuals outside Apple. Now, I think that's pretty important because basically the open source community is now driving what's pretty much a proprietary language. Uh, and it comes from languages like JavaScript and Python, which are completely interpreted, so there's no real compilation. So you've either got obfuscation or you're giving someone else the source code to run it. So what is open source? You could describe it as um, here's the source code. You can look at it. You can view it. You can modify it. You can distribute it. But that's not a great definition. The Oxford English Dictionary says, denoting software for which the original source code is made freely available and may be redistributed and modified. But that's still pretty ambiguous. The Open Source Initiative has this on their website. It's a 10 term definition. They're all here. So basically, free redistribution, so no royalties or fees on whatever you're distributing and no restrictions on who you distribute to. Um, source code, so you must include the source code and allow distribution in both source and compiled form. And there must be a well-publicized means of obtaining the code and no obfuscation. Um, derived works, so the license must allow modifications. And it must allow anything that's been modified to be redistributed within the same license. Uh, integrity of the author's source code, so you may restrict source code from being modified if the license allows for patch files. Um, but you must explicitly permit distribution built from modified code. And no discrimination against persons or groups and no discrimination against fields of endeavor, so this speaks not just to uh, racism or um, that sort of thing, but more as well accessibility. So um, you can't restrict the software to people that can't uh, see as well. And also, you just can't simply restrict software from, say, people that use Debian. It must be able to work on everything. Or at least, if not work on everything, then at least you can't stop them from trying to make it work on something. Um, the distribution of license, so the license must apply to everyone who uses it. You can't say it's one license for me and then another license for those people in that group and then another license for everyone else. It has to be the same license. Um, the license must not restrict other software, so that's like what I said before. You can't say you can only run this on Debian, not Ubuntu. Um, and the license must be technology neutral. So I can't say you can only run this on a MacBook Pro. You're not allowed to run it on your crappy iMac. Okay, so this is taken from the Open Source Initiative. They started in the no late 90s. Before that, Richard Stallman created the GNU project and the Free Software Foundation. And his idea of free software is quite different. And when I say free software, I don't mean you don't pay for it. He uses the word Libra, 
which basically relates a lot more to freedom rather than uh, freeness of software. And so he says, free software means that it respects the user's freedom and community. Roughly, the users have the freedom to copy, distribute, study, change, and improve the software. With these freedoms, users both individually and collectively control the program at what it does for them. So it speaks a lot more on how you can control the software rather than how the software controls you, which is what he says proprietary software does. So the best way to think of this is free speech, not free beer. Because free beer is just beer that you get without paying, whereas free speech is more relates to you're allowed to do this. You have control over your speech. Um, and he defines it as a set of freedoms. So basically, his freedoms are the freedom to run the program for any purpose, the freedom to study how the program works and change it so it does as you wish, the freedom to redistribute copies so you can help your neighbor, and the freedom to distribute copies of modified versions to others. So here's a diagram. This shows the difference between free software and open source software. So the big green section, that's free software. And then everything on the diagram is open source. So as you can see, open source pretty much encompasses everything. Free software is a fair bit more restrictive, but it, the licenses, there, there is a, a lot of overlap, as you can see. Um, tyrants, they are products where the source code is free, but the executable is not. So a lot of versions of Android exhibit this. So basically, you're given this product, and the code here is open source. You can look at it, but you can't change it. Only Google has the power to change Android, or be it the case Samsung or HTC or whoever happens to be running that particular distribution. So in a sense, it's not free software, but it's still classified as open source. Um, you might hear this known as um, a TiVo-wise device because the TiVo was the first product which actually did this. And that's how they, they describe it. And then this section here is just licenses which fit open source and don't fit free software. And there's a few of them. Um, as far as I'm aware, there are no known licenses that can be classified as free software that can't be classified as open source. So, who is using these? Well, unsurprisingly, Google. I just spoke about Android. Also, Chromium, their OS and browser. Not Chrome. Twitter is using it. And if you notice, they have 101 public repositories on GitHub. Probably the most popular one is Bootstrap, something I use a lot for responsive web design. Apple as well. This is their web page. This is the rest of their web page. They have a lot. I didn't count. You can go and count if you want and tell me how much it was. Um, there's quite a lot. And that includes things like Bonjour and WebKit. And at the top of their page, they say that not only do they use other people's open source software, but a lot of the stuff that they do is open source as well. And they say that their major strategy is based on open source. So it depends how you look at it. But um, So there's a lot of other companies using open source. It's not just technology companies. So GE are using open source. MasterCard are using open source. This is an e-commerce system that they've made. And then Chevron, the big energy company in the US, they and Sears Holdings are using Apache Hadoop, which is a cluster-based system, completely open source. And they're using it f to collect and process huge amounts of data. And then I'm not sure if you have heard about these people, but this is Cardalist. And their whole business model is based on open source. Now, whether it's open source is debatable because they charge for their software. So technically, it's not open source. But the way they license it still makes it open source. So basically, what you do is you pay a subscription fee. And that subscription gets you access to their account, their GitHub account. 
and so you can use it as much as you want. You can submit pull requests and make issues and contribute to the code while you have access, but you need to pay to get access. So it's an interesting business model how they've done it. So using open source software. So where can we find open source software? A lot of places. First of all, GitHub. GitHub is a great place to find open source software. D it depends on what you're looking for as well, but GitHub has over 5 million developers listed currently, and they try to make coding social and collaborative. So it's hard to, uh, to pass them by. However, it is pretty difficult to find something on GitHub. So if you're looking for something specific like, I want to find a library for iOS that handles networking. What do I search on GitHub? It's kind of difficult because they don't have proper keyword searches. You can search through code, but it's not very comprehensive. A better place to find that sort of thing would be to go into Cocoa Controls. Cocoa Controls is for Objective-C, so iOS and OSX components. It's mainly UI components, but you can find some other things on there. Um, they have over 15,000 controls submitted, and it pretty much all links back to GitHub. So when you submit a control, the first thing it does is comes up with a window and says, what is the link to the GitHub repository for this control? Uh, and a lot of companies do this. A lot of websites do this. They just basically get big lists of GitHub repositories and make it nice and keyword searchable. Um, Packagist is the same sort of thing, except it's used for PHP. Um, so, and it uses a thing called Composer as package management, which is quite interesting. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then there's SourceForge and CodePlex. Those are also good repositories. SourceForge is very good. Um, they contain a lot of pre-compiled code that you can download. So you can download software like VLC or um, FileZilla or Notepad++, those sort of things just pre-exist, pre-compiled on SourceForge. But if you go looking, you can actually download all the source code for them. Um, and if you still can't find anything, just looking on Google, if you know what to search for, it's, there's usually something there. You might just find a Stack Overflow article that links to another piece of source code that someone might like. Okay, so once you've found the source code, you want to get it and you want to start using it. So there's a number of ways to do this. My preferred way is to use version control. So I like to download Git submodules so they can update independently of my project. I don't have to worry about committing them. If the owner makes a fix, I don't have to worry about constantly checking whether he's made a fix, re-download the files, reinstall them. You can use a thing called CocoaPods, which is package management for Objective-C objects, for Objective-C components, um, and Composer, which is package management, for, package management for PHP. And there's heaps of other of these package managers. These two are real, CocoaPods is really nice. I haven't used it that much, but it downloads to a specific version, so you can say, 0.1.star, and that'll download all of the 0.1s. So if, if they release 0.1.2, it'll update to there. But it won't update to 0.2. And it will automatically import these into an XC workspace so that you don't have to worry about it. Composer does something similar. It basically stores all the files in a folder called vendor, and it creates an import file. So all you have to do is import that, and then everything else you've downloaded is ready for you to go. And then obviously, you can just download and copy the files into your project. But when you've got things like version control, there's obviously better ways to do things. So I would recommend against that. Um, so once you've got the source code, you're going to want to use it. So if you're using something like Composer or CocoaPods, this isn't really that relevant. But you would. You either want to include the files or import the files into the project. And so they'll get compiled with all your source code. Or you can link them as static libraries. Some developers, when they make iOS projects, and I do this, 
with their Xcode project, they will make something you can build and it builds into a static library. So what you do is you grab your Xcode project from the sub-module, you drag it into Xcode, and then you can um, just link it against the static library. Makes things a lot easier. You don't have to worry about if they've used Arc and you haven't, or if they've used special compile compiler flags that'll crash things in your program. And then once you've got them, then you just simply call your classes, functions, methods, as if they're your own code. So contributing. Contributing can come in many forms. So if you find a useful feature that you think would be good, or if you find issues or bugs, or even just general suggestions, everything helps the owner. I like getting feedback on my repositories that I've got on GitHub. Um, it's good to know that people are using them to start with, but especially, yeah, it's good to know that people are actually looking through the source code and saying, cool, there's a bug there. Maybe you should fix that. Here's something that might help. Um, so, and sometimes code just might not be capable. Hold on. Right, sometimes the owner might not have the capability to, um, to continue maintaining the software, and this is where contribution really comes in. Because things like compatibility with future updates stop working. Um, and usually if someone else wants to contribute, owners won't have a problem. If someone wants to contribute to my projects, then go for it. Um, and if your code is hosted on Git, and GitHub makes this really easy to do, you can just make a fork, and so what will happen is you will basically get your copy of their code. It's like branching. And you make your copies, you, um, you push to your repository, and then you know, if the owner wasn't happy with what you were doing, then, well, that's, that's your problem now, not theirs. Getting help is very trust-based in the open source community. So it's not always possible. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, always try and do it yourself first before you ask the owner or whoever's developing it. Um, if you're really stuck, then send them an email. If, you f if it's a bug, then uh, logging an issue would be the best if they have an issue tracking system. Um, but yeah, there's no guarantees. so. Just try and work the code out if you can, otherwise you're gonna have to look at other options. Sometimes it's just not worth going through all the extra effort. Um, yeah. Okay, so creating open source software. So, as a minimum, this is what you really need to put in your repositories. So whatever source code it is, so build script or instructions if it's necessary. Sometimes it's just a, like a simple PHP script that doesn't really need to be built. And then a license. So license should go in a file called just license or license.txt. Um, if you don't put a license in there, it defaults to copyright, so you've got to be careful with that. Um, so with your source code, try and use recognizable function names, try and use meaningful object names, and try and make sure that you're not using things that are likely to clash with other objects. Not just system objects, but anything that, um, that another developer might use. So try and namespace your object as best you can. Documentation. I know we all hate doing it, but comments are probably the best thing. You don't really have to go over the top. Um, Java comments work really well. These are java.comments if you haven't seen them before. Um, they start with a double star at the start, otherwise they're not java.comments. And you can use these to generate basically web pages. And 
in the latest version of Xcode, Xcode will go through these comments and display them in their inline help, which is really cool. Um, so a readme file is usually very good. Try and include a readme file. That's usually where you can put stuff like example code and a demo. Uh, and try and write them in mark out, markdown format as well. A lot of people like markdown format. Um, it's not very hard to learn. Um, I think it's on John Gruber's blog where you can find the, the actual instructions for it. And GitHub have their own version of markdown. Um, example code is always good. It uh, shows the user what exactly, what is possible, I guess, and uh, a demo as well. So as much as or as little as, like, as you want, I guess. It depends on um, how much time you have, how expandable it is, how general it is. OK, support. So once again, open source is all trust-based. So if you don't respond to emails, if you don't respond to issues, if you just leave your repository left and un, um, unmaintained, then people will just stop using it. And you'll, uh, you'll lose trust of other developers. You'll lose respect as well. Um, Unless you sort of explicitly say, you know, this repository is no longer maintained. I'm not responding to emails about it. Um, so for this reason, the best product isn't always what's the best. Or sorry, it's not always what's most used. It's usually the ones that are the best documented, the ones that are best supported. So. You don't have to respond to every email within minutes. Even waiting a week in some circumstances you would be fine. Usually an acknowledgement would be right. If someone says that there's a bug and you don't have time to fix it, tell them that. Respond in an email or respond, open a ticket for them. Or open a ticket so that all of your users can see that there's this bug here, I know about it. If someone else wants to fix it, go fix it. Submit a pull request. Uh, if users are willing to fix bugs and implement new features, then encourage it, because it'll make you look good, if your name's on the repository. Um, and yeah, so just encourage collaboration as much as you can. And definitely use issue tracking. The issue tracking on GitHub is awesome, um, and it doesn't cost you anything. It just it's there, and everyone knows. How, everyone that uses GitHub pretty much knows how to use the GitHub issue tracking, uh, and it's way better than just keeping a text file somewhere in your repositories called to do and just has a list of stuff. Okay. And the other thing is, if someone if someone emails you, it's OK to open an issue on someone else's behalf. So creating open source for your own use. Now, there's a few times you might want to do this. Maybe you're making a component that you want to keep so that you can reuse it again yourself or within a company. Um, so this is something I've done a few times. I've just I've been working on a project, and I was like, hey, this would be cool if I just made this open source. So basically, what you do is, so there's two ways you can do it. You can build both at the same time, or you can go and build your component and then integrate it back into your project. Um, my recommendation would be to do a mix. Go and make your component, get it to some level of working, and then put it in your project and make it great get it to stable. And then from there, you can just continue the development of the features and fix bugs. Um, 
if you have an existing component that you want to open source as well, pretty much the, the same sort of thing. You just want to make all of your code as independent as possible. Remove it from your project, put it into your new repository, and then put your new repository back into your code, back into your project, and then work from there. Licensing. People hate licensing. I hate licensing. But I'm still going to do it. There's a lot of licenses. These are the licenses listed on the Open Source Initiative's website. They're the only ones that they have approved. There is a lot more. These are the ones you're likely to actually use. Um, and just a note before I go any further, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not giving legal advice. <laughs> just so we're clear. Okay, so copyleft licenses. Copyleft is a play on words on copyright. They're trying to say this is the opposite of copyright. Basically, what it means is these are licenses where they're open source or free to start with, and any derivative work must also be free. Usually, um, the license explicitly says that whatever derivative work or distributed work must contain the exact same license. So an example of this is GPL. GPL would be classed as a copyleft license. <clears throat> Some of them have special cases, but it's probably best if to steer clear for GPL if you're using it in proprietary works. And this would include if you have a component that you integrate into an app. So it's not just modifying it, it's um, merging it, I guess. Permissive licenses are what you want to use in proprietary works. So they have minimal requirements about redistribution. It allows you to change the license if you modify anything. Um, and you can use these in proprietary work. Um, the term public domain varies. So it's probably not a good idea to say this work is in the public domain. And in a lot of places, there's a bit of debate over whether you can actually say this work is in the public domain because you haven't been dead for 70 years. And the other thing too is, depending on where you go, the definition of public domain is slightly different. So steer clear of public domain. Now, no license. No license does not mean public domain. No license means copyright. That's a big gotcha of a lot of people. Now, the thing you have to be careful about is if your code is hosted somewhere, the site you host with will likely have a set of terms and conditions or a license that encompasses anything that doesn't have its own explicit license. So in this case, yes, read the terms and conditions, read the license agreement. So this is a warranty. I'm sure you've probably seen this before. Um, definitely include this with anything you put up anywhere. Otherwise, people will go, this is your fault. I'm suing you. Basically, it just removes all liability and responsibility from yourself or whoever it is that, is that has made the code because everyone looks for someone to blame when something goes wrong. And we've all seen it happen before. This is a nice website I found, chooseolicense.com. It does pretty much what it says. I want it to be simple and permissive. I'm concerned about patents. Or I care about sharing improvements. So this is basically permissive, copy, sorry, that's copy left. And that's permissive as well. The Apache and the SVN licenses have some extra restrictions on them. Um, this is pretty funny. I found this when I was doing a bit of research. WTFPL. 
Um, this is pretty clear. That, that, that license is not free. I know. It's still open source, technically, though. Because you're allowed to change it as long as you change the name. Anyway. I'm lost. It's not required for source, you can't change the license. No, it's implicit on what the user wants to do with it. Therefore, I need my lawyer to give extra. <laughs> okay, so this, um, this license this was basically made to have a go at the free software people and the open source people because they're basically having a war. Um, and the GPL license and the BSD license, which is their sort of um, godchild licenses, he says that there's too many unacceptable, obnoxious clauses in them, which is pretty true, and he hates the warranty. He thinks that's terrible. So that's why Sam, I don't know how I say his name properly, Hosevar, I think, that's why he made this license. Um, and it is actually a valid license. I wouldn't recommend using it unless you change some of the profanity. So, as a developer, why should you use open source software? You can save time and money. Why would you re-engineer something that has already been created? You can use code that someone else has spent their own time and money on and not have to do any extra work or a little bit of extra work. If you're creating open source, you can build a reputation. Um, especially if what you've written is stable, tested, good quality, well supported. Um, open source software, if you like, being involved in a community, if you like being involved in collaboration, this is a great way to do that. Um, I don't think there's any other real circumstances where you can collaborate on projects with 100 other people or 1,000 other people, all distributed over the world to work on one amazing project, something like Linux. Uh, and these projects are usually to benefit not just yourself, not just the people writing them, but everyone. So Linux or OpenOffice, for example. Um, another thing is you can just do it. If you like coding, you can just do it as a hobby rather than tendering to your pot plants, keeping your fish. Um, if you like doing this in your spare time, then why not share it? So in the interest of representing both sides of the argument, here are some reasons why you wouldn't want to use open source software. So, time and money. There are reasons that you should and shouldn't use open source software. So in some circumstances, it's gonna take a lot more work to try and integrate some piece of code that someone else has written into your project. And this would be a lot more common in older projects and in very large scale projects as well. Um, a lot of people don't like the support in open source, even though it's um, community-based and it's still there, they like to be able to call up the company and complain to them, I need help with this, I need help with that, and blame. Everyone likes blame. If you've paid for something, you can blame them. If you haven't, then, and they've got that warranty there, then there's not a lot you can do. And when it comes down to it, it's basically about risk. If you're a business, you want to minimize your risk as much as possible and there's a lot less risk if you're paying for software uh, rather than using open source. But the truth is there's not really any way to get around using open source. I already showed you before that, well, a lot of companies are now using open source software as part of their strategies. Um, and pretty much everything well, a lot of technology, pretty much every piece of technology you own has open source components, not just 
your laptop or your phone, but things like your watch. And open source doesn't even, it's not restricted to just technology or just uh, information technology. Even things like your clothes. Clothes have, I guess, architectures that need to be designed and developed. And even those sorts of things can be put into open source. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. If anyone has any questions.